Hi, I'm Lisa Burgess and I'm a master's student here at the Royal College of Music studying composition for screen. I'm delighted to be here today to mark 2017's International Women's Day and to be joined by distinguished composer and lecturer here at the college, Erilyn Wallen. Thank you so much for being here today. So firstly, um, I've noticed you've got such a varied portfolio of work um, and I'd be really interested to hear about some of your early influences and whether you think your progression and development as a composer has been a natural process or whether it's been a really conscious decision to explore such a vast and diverse scope of musical styles. Well, I mean, when I started in, in, in music, I really didn't have an idea that I would be a composer, even though I was composing. Uh, I grew up in Tottenham and um, you know, went to school there and I just didn't equate the composers I loved with, you know, with myself. And so my journey into music in a way has been that of a, of a music lover. And so, and also the thing of composing has been always such a natural part of my life that in a way, once I started and acknowledged myself, to myself that I was a composer, I, the first thing was to say, well, I will really try and earn my living from being a composer. I really want to be out in the world. And so once you decide that, that means um, you really pretty much take what comes your way. And so that's why I've sort of done some very unusual things. Like I, I was remembering how I did this game show years and years ago, and Carolina Hearn was in it. There were a lot of, a lot of comedians from Manchester. We did it in Granada. And I was thinking, how did I end up doing that? But, but in a way, I just think a composer, for me, a composer should really try and be in the world yeah. in different situations. And so there's a lot of, I'm asked to do a lot of really unusual things that in a way have helped my knowledge, knowledge of mm. composing and the world. I think that's really important as well. And of course, music is such a subjective area. Is another person's opinion and acceptance of your work important to you? You know, when you first start out with composing and you um, have your first pieces performed, mm you really feel tremendously exposed and you really want everybody to love your music. Uh, and then you go on and you realise some people might actually take a violent dislike to it. Or, uh, and I think in the world of music there's also a lot to do with perception. People think they know what somebody's music is like and they, they, they sort of sometimes forget that the person is often different to the music they write. But what you've got to do is develop quite a thick skin and try and remind yourself while you're writing music, the reasons you're doing it. And you really have to accept that not everybody will like it. But having said that, I do really want people to love the music and try to understand the message I'm trying to put across. But I think music's such a sharing thing and we're all so very different that, it, you know, not everybody's going to like everything. And I think it's fair to say the role of the composer has changed considerably over the last, say, 100 years. Um, and I wonder if, in your career, if you had personally seen the role of the composer change and whether you think that composers today need to become businesswomen and businessmen in order to be successful in this industry. You know, I've seen massive changes and it actually makes me smile. And that's one of the good things about getting older. You see things come around. So when I started out, I really wanted to write music that really reflected the things I loved and that's, there's a wide range of influences and you know, for instance I like writing songs, I love performing them and when I was starting out people were saying oh no you just can't do that, you can't write that music, you can't perform and then play, you can't do this and that and all of those things now are seen as strengths to be able to be versatile and then when I think about composers who are really massively successful like Philip Glass, you know whatever we think of the music Philip Glass and and Reich and John Adams, they're all composers who really took their career in their own hands by forming their own ensembles and groups and getting their music performed. Some like Philip Glass has his own, from the beginning, uh, has his own publishing house and has taken control of his recordings. And I just think these days composers must know that they're like small businesses. They are, they're, they're are entrepreneurs. And it's the more we know about the business side of things, the more we um, I, the more we can sort of control things and, and really keep hold of our copyrights and, mm. and also to start to think about how things are done because I still think things are done in a very old-fashioned way in, uh, in music. So things like, um, I was at a, uh, with a group of composers, for instance, why are there no uh, radio pluggers for classical music? And there are in, um, there are in pop music, say. Uh, just the way of... Uh, just the way of approaching the whole production of music 
and then the dissemination of it. We've got a lot to learn and things have changed so much because of the internet. So in other words, internet means that you don't necessarily need to publish the way you would have done. And so your work, can you can get it out to an audience if you have a good website, if you, um, you know, can form your own groups, you can you know, make your own entries, you know, m own introductions to people. So it's, there's, in a way, there's more for composers to be done now than there used to be. But it, uh, so in other words, I think in the olden days, composers could, <laughs> the olden days, composers, say if you had to publish in a record company, you'd be looked after. Now, everybody has to really work hard to make things happen for themselves. And I think that's no bad thing. So the industry is very male dominated. Um, I wonder who some of your female influences are. You know, when I was a little girl um, growing up, I because I didn't know I was going to be a composer, the people I idolised, of course, were men. So Bach and you know Stravinsky and Chopin. I loved all those people, and it, you know it never occurred to me uh, as a young girl that uh, I needed a role model. I just would look to the music. But to have a role model is very, it just gives you that sense of hope. I would say that starting out, I just, you know, just what always drove me was the actual music itself, wanting to make music. But I'm so proud to know, so Paul, Pauline Oliveros, who just died fairly recently, I'm so proud to have known her as a friend because I just love the way she's wanted to do something and has just done it. And something like Judith Weir, they're all about the music and just wanting to write the music that really nobody else can write. And so what's been wonderful since I've grown up is that there have been more, really more successful contemporary composers. And also we're beginning to discover, um, discover so many others who really, whose work has been dismissed. Um, I know when I was a student studying undergrad, I was really loved the music of Elizabeth Shackett de la Guerre, who was a 17th century French uh, clavecinist uh, composer. And I was just wondering about her. So you come across these, these composers through history who've lived, and I think there's loads and loads more. We are often um, advised of the importance of collaborative work, and I notice you formed your own ensemble, Ensemble X, whose motto is, we don't break down barriers in music, we don't see any. Has having this positive mindset supported and contributed to, to your success as a musician? I hope so. I'd, I'd say at the heart of it, I hope it's because I write music that people want to hear, but what it was, I was working with lots of different musicians from different, different sort of different um, strengths, different parts of the music world. And I really wanted to do something where we could present our music in a, you know, with the idea of enjoyment and fun. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I was composing very much for each musician's characteristics. Well, I don't work so much as Ensemble X now, but um, I think the idea of working with people, working well with them, is crucial for any composer. So you can write the greatest music in the world, but you have to be able to know how to behave in a, in a, rehearsal room. I know many composers who never say thank you to a performer who spent maybe weeks and months learning them. It's just just the normal things of being a human being and I think it's one of the greatest privileges to, you know to be a composer. I just I'm so thrilled anytime anybody takes time to learn my music and then a, you know the thrill of being in a say a big auditorium with a symphony orchestra playing your music. It's just very humbling and so I just think uh, to always remember the joy of music making and just remembering what a fantastic thing it is to be involved in it. And along any career path of course there are problems and challenges along the way and often um, we feel as though we can't prepare for them but it is important that we feel as though we can be prepared to be aware of them. So what advice would you give to any aspirational composer of today that is preparing for a successful career in music? Um. Always be prepared to negotiate. Just don't take the first offer. I see quite a lot of exploitation of young composers. So competitions where you might have to pay to enter, where people might take your copyright. I'd say, I say to any composer to really, to really study, you know, copyright laws as much as you can, because I think there's a lot of um, sort of ignorance around that area. And just to be, uh, when you don't know something, really be prepared to get an expert advice and sometimes it means paying for that advice but little things like joining PRS for example they give some free legal advice but just knowing 
you know, the various, I, I look at contracts pretty much on a weekly basis. And some contracts are absolutely shocking where they'll say, uh, in order for you to write this music, you have to give away your whole copyright. And it looks very innocuous, but it's, I, I just think, yeah, to be aware of, um, you know, good legal practice is, is a really first start, I would say. So thank you so much for being here today. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you.